good evening to everyone to all of my respected seniors my colleagues and my uh, dear post graduates i am really thankful for the ioapg platform for giving me this opportunity the i am today presenting the genu velgus case so in orthopedic practical examination case uh, case presentation scenario evaluation of a patient there are two aspects first evaluation of a patient by a post graduate examinee and then followed by the evaluation of examinee by an examiner by certain questions what are your diagnosis why are you saying so what else it can be and how will you manage so in my presentation i will go through these two parts in first half first part and the second half first part so valgus valgus alignment is the inward angulation of the extremity in the coronal plane with the tibia laterally deviated in relation to the femur distal segments deviates away from the midline and the apex of the deformity they directed towards the midline every valgus at knee is considered to be a deformed deformity is it so no it is not exactly it depends on the age and the degree of valgus these two things determine whether this deformity can be considered whether this valgus is considered as a deformity or not selenius and venka in 1975 they came up with a landmark uh, pictorial representation on the graph they have just uh, plotted the tibio femoral angle evolution over the age in this we can see that initially from the birth up to the 1 and 1/2 to 2 years child is having a varus this and from 1 and 1/2 at 1 and 1/2 to 2 years it becomes neutral thereafter after the neutral it at around 3 and 1/2 to 4 years it becomes maximum and thereafter at around 7 to 8 years it attains the normal adult value so after 7 to 8 years value of 7 to 8 degree is considered as normal beyond 7 to 8 degree is moving towards the abnormal side etiology this could be physiological this could be pathological so physiological knock knees apparent genu valgus can be apparent because of the fat thighs because of the ligamentous flexicity because of the rotational deformity for example tibial torsion femoral antiversion they all lead to the increased genu valgus or sometimes the flat foot can also leads to the apparent genu valgus there are certain pathological causes idiopathic trauma it could be malunited because of some previous fracture this could be fracial injury this could be metaphyseal tibial fracture metaphyseal tibial fracture which we commonly known as the cousin's fracture that can lead to the valgus deformity certain tumor or tumor like conditions like fibrous dysplasia and chondromatosis multiple hereditary exostosis infection metabolic causes rickets and renal osteodystrophy neuromuscular causes cerebral palsy polio skeletal dysplasias and then the syndromic associations if the pg is asked that is there any syndrome then ellis van creveld syndrome is associated with this this is the different presentation of the genu valgus this in this you can see there is a unilateral genu valgus and in this you can see that there is a unilateral genu valgus but on the x ray of this patient you can see that this uh, genu valgus is because of the fib distal femoral deformity and it is due to the infection this patient had an infection history in this case you can see there is a unilateral genu valgus with limb length discrepancy and here you can see that there is a this valgus is increased on weight bearing this signifies that along with the limb length discrepancy this patient is also having ligamentous laxity i am saying these ligamentous laxity limb length shortening short stature these are the red flag signs in this case you can see that there are bilat this there is a bilateral genu valgus and there are multiple swelling this is a case of multiple hereditary exostosis these are the different presentations of genu valgus so what are the red flag signs means when we can say that the genu valgus is pathological when there is a asymmetric involvement when there is a short stature when there is a limb length discrepancy these three features and certain other syndromic uh, features of the child can suggest us that this valgus is not physiological but it moving towards the pathological side so now moving to the patient evaluation with the understanding that we have so far read history journal 
uh, this is the normal framework that we follow usually during the patient evaluation, history, physical examination. That starts with the gait, journal examination, local examination, inspection, palpation, movements, measurements, neurovascular, special tests, and examination of joint and above and below. Gait is important in the journal physical exam. Journal examination in the genu valgus case is a very important thing. Why I am saying so? Because rickets features are very much suggestive of the cause of genu valgus. So, skeletal dysplasia features which can only be picked up by the head to toe examination these suggest the cause of the genu valgus and other skin changes other examination of the swelling in other parts of the body suggesting of the multiple hereditary exostosis that's why journal physical examination is more important moving further i want to suggest the post graduates that don't try to impose book on the patient it's always find out that what children do what post graduates do they try to find uh, impose the book findings on the patients so moving to the history chief complaints usually the patient of the genu valgus presents with the chief complaint of concern about the cosmesis and future performance this concern could be from the parents grandparents or from the patient itself and if the patient is adolescent pain limp or gait disturbances could be there patient could have the history of stumble down or fall down or patient can complain of or parents can complain of fatigueness clumsiness because of the nutritional deficiencies chief complaint elaboration is followed by the history of present illness in history of present illness basically we elaborate this chief complaints which out of which deformity is most important so we should inquire about the onset when the parents first notice the deformity and how the deformity is progressed whether it is progressive or not progressive whether it is associated with other features like pain limp clumsiness or stumbling like this history of present illness followed with other additional histories sometimes we call it the negative history and other histories history these histories help us to to find out the exact cause of the valgus history about the trauma past infection metabolic disease swelling bowel disorder renal disorder skin disorder bowel disorder and skin disorder are important because they suppress the vitamin d absorptions renal disorder it can lead to the renal dystrophy swellings in other parts of the body then followed by the birth history developmental milestones is important family history other sibling or family member with the same condition or the bone disease nutrition history socio economic history treatment history or the functional history functional history at present what functional incapacities or what the functional condition of the child is then history after physical examination physical examination should start with the examination of the height and the weight these two things are important because height short stature and rickets dysplasia syndromes weight overseas children can have an apparent valgus rapid progression your future performance that's why weight and height and even the bmi is more important then moves to a journal examination journal examination what can we get from the journal examination nutritional status of the patient skin examination stigmata of rickets craniotapes depressed nasal bridge prominent forehead harrison sulcus rachitic rosary broad raised double malleolus sign at the ankle head to toe examination for any syndromic features like dental problems polydactyly in ellis van krebold syndrome as i have already told stigmata of skeletal dysplasia short stature disproportionate body segment relationship spinal deformities depressed nose that's why i told that journal examination is more important in this valgus child if you finding it that it is asymmetric then moving to the further examination gait what kind of the gait this patient presents it presents with adduction at the hip here you can see knees touching each other widely spaced ankles there will be the medial thrust means femur moves towards the medially over the tibia and the, overall the we can say that circumduction gait before moving further <coughs> comfortable with you proper exposure from the waist to the ankle with proper cover over the private parts examine in standing sitting supine and prone position follow the proper guidelines symmetry we have to examine for the symmetry whether it is unilateral because usually pathological unilateral uh, usually uh, physiological sorry and bilaterally usually physiological limb length discrepancy 
whether the deformity is localized or generalized, skeletal dysplasias. During our palpation findings, these can have the joint surface irregularities, instabilities, <laughs> and discrepancies. Examine for the patellofemoral instability. It's also an important because it is one of the complication of the genu valgus. Then movements for the range of motion. Measurements like size circumference, limb length discrepancy if present, angular profile, rotational profile assessments. Moving further, assessment of the site of deformity, femur or the tibia. All postgraduates must know this test. Patient should be supine, knees flexed and touching each other, both feet and medial malloli approximated. If the deformity resolves, then it is in femur, otherwise in tibia. Angular profile measurement. There is a lot of confusion about the angular profile measurement and usually the postgraduates miss the rotational profile measurement. So I am moving further. Angular profile measurement, TVO femoral angle, which is more important, clinical or radiological, intermalular distance. Initially, TVO femoral angle was described as a radiological uh, position, standing erect with hips and knees fully extended and neutral rotation with patella facing forward, both knees touching each other. Please, post, I suggest postgraduates to understand this position. Then they should mark the ASIS. They should mark the center of the patella. They should mark the center of the ankle joint, both medial malloli. Join the axis with the ASIS with the center of patella and the center of patella with the ankle joint. Just position this patient in this way, fully extended erect. ASI, mark the ASIS, mark center of patella, mark the center of ankle joint, join ASIS with the center of patella, join center of patella with the center of ankle joint. And if you put the goniometer over it, then the angle between these two is the TVO femoral angle. Moving further, mark both uh, for the intermalar distance, mark both the medial malloli, this and this. Distance between these two is the intermalar distance. TFA and intermalar distance is very important for the evaluation of genu valgus. In certain books, there is a classification of the severity of deformity given on the basis of intermalar distance like this. Less than 5, it is mild. 5 to 10, moderate. More than 10, severe. Now, moving to the rotational profile assessment. Foot progression angle. It was given by Stelly and it is very important in the genu valgus or the genu varus case because Genu valgus could be because of the hip cause, could be uh, uh, rotation at the hip, a femoral antiversion, it could be because of the tibial torsions. These, this rotational profile assessment can only can give you the idea about whether the deformity is because of the tibia, whether the deformity is because of the femoral antiversion. This is the significance to rule out significant to rule out the rotational deformity. That's what I'm told. So moving further, foot progression angle. Angle that the foot makes with the path on which the subject is walking, axis of the foot, line of progression. So this is the axis of the foot. This is the line of progression. And if we put a goniometer here, then the angle between this is the foot progression angle. Approximately, it is 10 to 15 degree external normally. Moving to thigh foot angle. If we make the thigh axis, then we have to make the foot axis. And if we put the goniometer on that, then the angle between these two axes is the thigh foot angle. Thigh foot angle normally is 20 degree normal. If it is an internal rotation, we give it a positive value. If it is an outward rotation, we give it a negative value. Then moving to the rotations at the hip. One axis along the leg. One axis along the perpendicular towards with the couch. And if we put a goniometer over here, the angle between this the medial rotation of the hip. Medial rotation is normally 70 degree. Moving further to the lateral rotation around the hip. One axis along the leg and the other is the other axis of the goniometer, which is perpendicular to the couch. If we put a goniometer here, the angle between these is the lateral rotation of the hip. It is normally 30 degree. Along with the lateral rotation, there is a fifth part of the rotational profile. That is the assessment of the foot shape. Like uh, if it is medially directed or not, be, uh, that signifies the intoing also. But after the angular and the rotational profile assessment, we have to assess for the assessment of the joint laxities because of the joint laxity. This, these are the five. Uh, these are the pictures of the Beekton's score: hyperextension at the elbow, touching of the thumb with the forearm, 
hyper extension of the fingers hyper extension of the knee and the touching of the floor with the spine now moving to the another important part of the assessment q angle assessment q angle the angle why the q angle is q angle with its apex at the patella formed between the ligamentum patelli and the extension of the quadriceps resultant distally this is the actual definition that was given by the frexton in his original paper what's the significance of q angle significance of q angle is that it signifies that because of the valgus there is is there any patellar instability or not what is the method of examination and conditions that can increase or decrease the q angle so moving to the method of examination there is a lot of confusion about the angle uh, how we measure the q angle whether it is in extended position whether it is in standing position whether it is in sitting position or flexion of the knee this is the picture that was originally given by brexton in his original paper he measured the q angle in the extended position or you can say standing position here is the asis here is the center of the patella and one point is the tibial tuberosity so and this is the picture that is signifying that measurement of the q angle in 30 degree in some good books like campbell also it has been given that it should be measured in supine position with the 30 degree flexion at the knee because at that position patella sits in the group of the femoral condyles so what's the difference between the sitting and supine and flexion so basically q angle decreases if we move from extension to flexion normally which in the book or you, i can quote the campbell campbell is saying that in males it is 8 to 10 degree female 15 degree they have measured it in the 30 degree of flexion so from the fl uh, extension to the flexion it decreases so please mark that how you can uh, quote the q angle measurement in 30 degree of the knee, fle knee flexion measurement and can quote these values in flexion <coughs> it can move to 0 degree also here how the q angle is affected high femoral neck retroversion and internal tibial torsion in this q angle decreases q angle decreases because and another part is the antiversion at the femur and external tibial torsion in this q angle increases why this is increasing and decreasing the basic phenomena is this this is the resultant of the quadriceps and this is the resultant of the patella tendon so whenever the tibia rotates laterally tibial tuberosity move outward and this in can cause the increase in the q angle and whenever there is a quadriceps uh, resultant moves externally then it can lead to the increase in the q angle that's why q angle measurement is important and every postgraduate should examine it just to stamp then whether there is a risk of patellar instability or not now after moving from here now we can move to the evaluation of examinee by the examiner so this is our patient actually 12 year old male product of the full term normal vaginal delivery complain of the cosmetic deformity and fall while running with the gait disturbance mother noticed deformity at the age of 7 years deformity is progressive no history of trauma infection or any swelling family history unremarkable general examination nothing significant range of motion full abnormal q angle tfa and intramalar distance hip and knee examination normal so first question what examiner asked what's your diagnosis 16 year old boy of bilateral idiopathic genu valgus having tibio femoral angle of 20 degree intramalar distance of 16 cm q angle of 15 degree without any rotational deformity with normal range of motion here in the when you say what's your diagnosis in that diagnosis you have to utter what's the what is your patient actually what's his age because age is important then what's the cause of the deformity whether it is idiopathic or what you have to include that in your diagnosis then about the deformity per se then you have to, that's why you have to include tibio femoral angle intermalar distance and as well as the q angle and rotational deformity to exclude that they, this valgus is not because of the hip or the tibia then why do you say so when this question arises why do you say so in this you have, i have already told you that in the history you have to take the differentials uh, exactly on what parts your differentials depend your differentials depend actually on the 
एक्चुअल इटियोलॉजी ऑफ द पेशेंट वेदर इट इज फिजियोलॉजिकल और पैथोलॉजिकल कॉजेज तो स्टार्ट फ्रॉम द हिस्ट्री मूविंग थ्रू द जर्नल एंड लोकल एग्जामिनेशन वॉट एवर यूर पॉजिटिव फाइंडिंग्स आर गिव दैम एज इन द सपोर्ट ऑफ योर डायग्नोसिस put your positive as well as negative points that strengthen your diagnosis negative points such as if i am saying that my patient is having the idiopathic genu valgus then i should exclude infection trauma skeletal dysplasia rachitic features all these negative findings i have to exclude these that's then only i can stamp this as a idiopathic genu valgus next question what examiner asked what else can it be in this also put your differentials here then what what else it can be that what uh, this genu valgus what are the other causes of this genu valgus or what others uh, reasons of this genu valgus can be so all your differentials can come here the reason that can lead to the genu valgus deformity then the last question how will you manage when we say when how will you manage then comes the diagnostic workup as well as the treatment part in your diagnostic workup you have to include the imaging you have to include the laboratory tests so in imaging full length x ray of the bilateral lower limbs is most important in the assessment of the genu valgus radiologically and x rays of the wrist and the knee sometimes ankle joint just to exclude any rickets or other features or sometimes the spine x rays just to exclude other skeletal dysplasias there comes the laboratory tests whole metabolic profile calcium phosphate serum vitamin d alkaline phosphatase complete hemogram esr renal function test urinary calcium phosphorus and pth pth and urinary pth you can uh, do on the patient wise basis but basically calcium phosphate serum vitamin d alkaline phosphatase are more important along with the complete hemogram all these investigations are important because these are these can also signify the cause of the genu valgus these can also strengthen your diagnosis these can also support in the planning of your management whether the uh, disease is active or whether the disease is not active so and thereafter you move to treatment depending on your imaging assessment depending on your laboratory assessment and backed by your history and clinical examination so in the treatment observation you can observe the patient by when you can observe the patient it depends on the age of the patient and whether the deformity is physiological or not so if the deformity is physiological you can observe the patient if that patient is having the severe deformity suppose that patient is having the intermalar distance of more than 15 degree and the age is more than 8 or 9 years then in that patient you have <coughs> how you can intervene there are two methods either by the gradual correction or by the acute correction gradual correction you can do by the guided growth modulation or six axis correction devices like the hexapod taylor's special frame they are advanced frames actually or elizarov on acute correction by various corrective osteotomies like the medial closing wedge osteotomies <coughs> osteotomy that can also be done by the laterally so our imaging workup this is the way how the full length x ray to be done extra this full length x ray to be done from it should include the hip it should include the knee it should include the ankle then only you can make the anatomical axis mechanical axis of the femur and the tibia and the whole lower limb as, as well and then you only you can assess the deformity here i have drawn these axis this is the mechanical axis of femur this is the me uh, mechanical axis of the tibia these are the joint lines and this is the mechanic uh, this is the whole limb mechanical axis this is the there is a mechanical axis deviation why i am saying so this mechanical axis deviation is very important in just because because of this you can intervene this can give you a hint that you have to intervene and also define the degree of deformity stevens in his landmark paper given this uh, values these zones or we can say steven jones zone 1 2 and the 3 Stephen in his paper told that if your mechanical axis lies in the outward of zone two or mainly in zone three, you have to intervene either by the guided growth or either by the corrective osteotomy, depending on the age of the patient or the skeletal maturity. So I suggest for to for postgraduates that please learn, please remember how to take the full length X-ray and 
learn about this steven jones also along with these imaging you have to take the x rays of wrist and ankle on the wrist x ray if there is a rickets you can find the metaphyseal cupping fraying splaying epiphyseal thinning osteopenia all these features that can suggest the rickets cause so in our patient what we did the, our patient was a 12 year old child with a gen, idiopathic genu valgus so there was a growth potential remaining so we opted for the guided growth modulation this this way we did the guided growth here you can say that figure of 8 plate is applied now this is the standard treatment for skeletally immature patients so i suggest post graduates to read read about this treatment i suggest them to read about the kind of implant it is about few findings about this implant that it is it should be applied exclusively and how it should be followed then this is the final correction that we have achieved in our patient it is the same patient here you can see that the screws are diverted what this guided growth did that it temporarily arrested the growth on the medial side and allows the growth on the lateral side then both the genu valgus are corrected this is the final pictures of our patient that we are discussing here final correction of the genu valgus patient can sit quite comfortably there is no flexion deficit full extension we can also get the uh, adolescent genu valgus so in adolescent genu valgus if the skeletally immature patient you have to do the corrective osteotomies either acute correction or with the help of elizoro or six axis correction in this uh, this patient was a 19 year old lady uh, girl in this she was having the bilateral genu valgus deformity we did the dome osteotomy on the one side and left the other side and we have to operate it this further on so my take home message uh, after this discussion is for the post graduates is listen to the history from the parent or the patient carefully keeping in mind about all the possible causes of the given condition try to reach at provisional diagnosis don't miss to examine for the rickettsic signs and other syndromic features these are most important examiner can catch you if you have not examined the patient from the head to toe learn how to assess tibio femoral angle intermalar distance don't miss to examine rotational profile and ligamentous laxity features tfa imd rotational profile measurements learn i suggest to post graduates that learn the methods of how to examine the, these please practice them on your patients know how to take the full length x rays and remember the indications of observation guided growth and corrective osteotomies with this i am concluding my lecture thank you mm -hmm.